is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello and welcome to Global Business Europe, live from CGTN in London. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Brexit back to the drawing board. The EU and UK officials try to unpick the trade deal on Northern Ireland. Our other headlines, the global supply chain crisis. Now G7 ministers try to resolve the shipping and truck driver shortage. Dozens killed in a deadly apartment block fire in Taiwan with many seriously injured. And countdown to blast off, China prepares to send three astronauts to its new space station. EU and UK officials are once again holding Brexit negotiations, this time to discuss renegotiating the already agreed trade deal between Northern Ireland and the rest of Britain. The EU has offered a plan to reduce checks and paperwork needed for goods to travel between the two under the Northern Ireland Protocol, but it's unclear if this will be enough to satisfy the UK. The protocol has been widely unpopular, with some unionist groups from Northern Ireland challenging it in the High Court. It was agreed in the first place to allow Northern Ireland to remain part of the EU's single market for goods. Well, our correspondent Giles Gibson is watching the story for us from Brussels. Giles, what is the EU offering exactly and why is it so unpopular? Well, Jamie, the European Commission in the building behind me has put forward four key areas or four proposals in four key areas uh, for the Northern Ireland Protocol, all to do with moving goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, firstly, they want to cut the checks on retail goods, on things like uh, sausages, which have become a bit of a, a symbol in this entire dispute, in the British press at least. They want to cut those checks by 80%. They also want to cut the amount of customs paperwork required by half. Uh, they're also trying to invite more Northern Ireland uh, stakeholders to become involved in the process. Uh, that's things like the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, and finally, they want to ensure the long-term supply of medicines going into Northern Ireland. Uh, so while these, pro pro these proposals are certainly seen uh, as very radical here in Brussels uh, in terms of uh, the, what the European Commission are trying to do, uh, they're seen as really the European Commission trying to push the envelope here. Uh, the big question is, is whether this is just going to be enough for the British government after what they demanded uh, earlier in the week. Uh, we are expecting uh, British government minister Lord Frost, who was also the UK's chief Brexit negotiator, to come to Brussels for a lunch on Friday with his uh, European Commission counterpart Maros Sefcovic. Uh, not clear at this stage if uh, sausages are going to be on the menu for that lunch. <laughs> uh, what exactly do the uh, British and Irish leaders want from these negotiations? Well, from the Republic of Ireland side, there is absolutely no doubt that they want the European Commission and the UK government to work out some sort of a deal in the next couple of months as these negotiations get started. And that's because any sort of escalation in this dispute between Brussels and London would just cause, potentially down the road, some sort of uh, border checks along the, uh, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. And that could really just inflame sectarian tensions on the island of Ireland. Uh, and that's why we're seeing the Irish Taoiseach, uh, Mikhail Martin, encouraging the UK government to be open to these proposals that have been put forward by the European Commission. Uh, he said in an interview earlier on that it takes two to tango. But Jamie, we are just going to keep coming back to this same issue, I think, the issue about governance, the legal authority that oversees the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, in this, this speech that Lord Frost gave in the Portuguese capital, Lisbon, just a couple of days ago, he very much pitched the idea of international arbitration, those were exa his exact words, rather than the European Court of Justice, also known as the ECJ, overseeing any potential disputes between the two sides. So far, we just haven't had a single indication from the European Commission that they are going to be prepared to budge on whether the ECJ has overall oversight over the protocol.
Giles Gibson in Brussels. Thank you very much. Finance ministers from the G7 group of leading economies have agreed to work together to try and resolve global supply chain issues. It comes as container ships have been turned away from ports around the world amid a global shortage of lorry drivers to clear arriving containers. Our correspondent Andrew Wilson is following the story for us. So, Andrew, we know that the UK is facing a lot of problems, but there's also a bigger picture, isn't there? Yeah, there is. And I think uh, the, the penny is dropping now around the world, as borne out by the G7 uh, finance ministers meeting, is that really this is something completely new. This recovery from the pandemic has shaken the very foundations of what used to be a relatively smooth running world economy. The retail sector is under pressure because people haven't been spending and now all the orders are in. So it costs now instead of two and a half thousand dollars to send a container from China to the UK, it now costs something like fifteen thousand dollars. So prices are going through the roof. Shipping, as a result, has got completely snarled up uh, because of all the increase in orders and the fact there's been a, a becalmed uh, economy for a year and a half. Uh, and even energy. No one's got any energy, energy supplies. No one's been filling up their tanks. So there's a run on that as well. So if you look at that Ever Given, the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal in March uh, and showed us just how quickly things can get backed up in terms of that just-in-time supply operation, well, that's like it's happening now on a global scale. And the G7 ministers meeting, uh, although they discussed the fact that the UK is particularly exposed because of Brexit, because of the drivers' problems, because of the other issues with petrol and so on. This is now a global issue that everyone needs to address and address together. And at the moment, it seems, no one's really got a playbook to put forward. Britain, it seems, is not alone. The container jams, like the one at Felixstowe Port, are being seen around the world. In the UK, there are added domestic complications with HGV drivers and so on, but it's clear now that everyone is wrestling with a global supply chain crisis. I, I want to take a moment to reflect on the work that we started. In Washington, G7 finance ministers wrapped up proceedings in agreement that they faced a global challenge that was best tackled together. Well, I'd tell people, you know, to be reassured that we're doing absolutely everything we can to mitigate some of these challenges. They are global in nature, so we can't fix every single problem, but I feel confident that there'll be good provision of goods for everybody, and we are working our way to remove blockages where we can. The headline crisis is perhaps the long-standing congestion in California, where an armada of container ships lies idle, waiting weeks to offload in Los Angeles and Long Beach. The White House has now announced a new 24-7 shift pattern to tackle it, with a clear presidential call to national transportation networks to step up as well. The rest of the world is closing in, and we risk losing our edge if we don't step up. In order to be globally competitive, we need to improve our capacity to make things here in America, while also moving finished products across the country and around the world. We need to think big and bold. Shipping costs are five times what they were last year. In the UK, the lack of truck drivers is biting hard, and analysts are still predicting a difficult winter. Global or not, the government is choosing to remain buoyant in public. Well, the, the, the situation is uh, improving. I'm confident that people will be able to get their, their toys for, for Christmas. As I say, I, I quite understand why people are concerned by these headlines, but we are working through these challenges as we have worked through other challenges. So but there's no doubt that the pandemic has unearthed some extraordinary weaknesses in how the world does business and collateral damage in some sectors will be unavoidable. So, Andrew, a degree of positivity from the UK government there. But uh, what about consumers in the UK? Is it going to be a difficult winter? Well, the signs aren't good, Robert. I mean, Oliver Dowden there saying people are going to get their toys by Christmas, but apparently the big popular toys this year, Barbie dolls, Paw Patrol, PlayStation 5, there aren't any on the shelves, and they haven't left the containers, haven't left China yet. So there is a problem for the favourite toys this year as far as Christmas are concerned, but it goes further than that. Chicken prices, we've heard today, are going to go through the roof fairly soon. IKEA is saying it's not going to get its supply chains back to normal for at least another year, and all these things will hit the consumers, particularly in the UK, and the message is going around now that the era 
of low prices pretty much is over. Now, you've got a battle going on um, in Downing Street now. The Chancellor doesn't really want to bail out the big industries, but the Business Secretary does. Boris Johnson seems to be erring on the side of let's help our industry. So where is the money going to come from? Do we face a situation this winter where the Chancellor is unable to go after industry for the money, so finds itself again, just like the, the previous government, going after hospitals, schools, local councils, the health service, and, of course, raising taxes as well. It may be that the government has to round on the UK public one more time to fill the coffers. Andrew Wilson, thanks very much. Well, the supply chain crisis has led Germany's leading economists to cut their growth forecast for this year. They had been expecting an expansion of 3.7%, but that's been cut to 2.4%. Germany's economy relies heavily on exports, but its manufacturing sector has been hit by shortages of raw materials. It's expected to recover, though, with economists raising their growth forecast for next year to 4.8%. But what does that mean for the rest of Europe? Carsten Brzezewski is Chief Economist at ING Germany, and he joins us now. Thanks for being with us on the program today. So, as we heard there, manufacturing and exports, big parts of Germany's economy. So how serious an impact are these supply chain issues having? Well, an enormous one, because we saw, for example, already in the second quarter this year, when the entire world, or at least Europe, was celebrating the end of the lockdowns and an enormous rebound of economic activity. Um, Germany was lagging behind because industrial production actually shrank. And uh, from uh, from the data of this summer, same story here. Industrial production is not growing, despite the fact that order books are filled, that inventories have been reduced to record low levels. So normally, the manufacturing sector should boom, but due to the supply chain frictions, it is not. And, uh, and, and this means that, uh, like uh, the... Um, um, economic research agencies uh, concluded um, we will only have something like 2.5% growth this year in Germany, which also means that Germany will not be one of the first, but rather one of the last European countries returning to pre-crisis levels. So what do Germany's problems mean for the rest of Europe? Well, you know, it, it is a little bit like what they're saying, that if the, if the U.S. sneezes, the rest of the world uh, catches a cold. So this holds for Europe. And, and all the neighboring countries of Germany, if Germany now really is slowing down, um, the, the rest of Europe will also notice, um, because Germany, for most other European countries, is the most important trading partner. Um, there are, in, in neighboring countries, obviously, um, producers, companies, part of the uh, supply chain that, uh, that also leads to Germany. So this means that the entire European economy should see a slightly lower growth this year, and then, you know, this is the only upside, we'll also see more of a recovery in 2022. This supply chain issue, though, is a global one. Are we really at risk of a supply chain recession, as some have suggested? Well, clearly we are. Um, you know, like, you know, like, like you had in, in, the, in the previous reports, no one really knows how long these supply chain frictions will last. Now, currently, the assumption is that the, the logistic part of the supply chain friction should be over by the summer of next year. When you look to microchokes, uh, semiconductors, I think there the expectation currently is that it could take until the end of next year before, um, before the supply is back to normal. So which means 2022 will also still be about the supply chain friction. I would not go as far as saying that you know, this is a completely new problem which is here to stay, but it clearly stays longer than um, expected a couple of months ago. Karsten Brzezewski from ING Germany, great to get your thoughts today. Thanks very much for joining us. Well, China's factory inflation has risen to a staggering 10.7% in September. That's the highest level in 25 years. Experts say soaring commodity prices and the country's curbs on high energy consuming industries have led to that increase. Meanwhile, China's foreign trade with the EU increased by 20% in the first three quarters of the year. The total value of imports and exports between the two stood at $600 billion, with the EU remaining China's second largest trading partner after Southeast Asia.
The world's largest chip-making company, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, is predicting a rise of at least 50% in profits amid the global chip shortage. Net income in the three months to September was $5.6 billion, up over 16% on the previous quarter. TSMC also announced it's planning to build a new factory in Japan. The Turkish lira has fallen to a new record low after President Erdogan sacked three of the country's top central bankers. The currency fell to just over nine to the dollar after the dismissals were announced in a presidential decree late on Wednesday. The lira has now lost a fifth of its value so far this year. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, six people shot dead in violent protests in Beirut as the inquiry into last year's port blast gets underway. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Covering the world from four continents, a new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington, D.C., Nairobi, and London. Who connect, interact, and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The link only on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. has changed under the pressure of the pandemic. For many of us, life is returning to some kind of normal. As we're adapting to changes in all of our lives, let Global Business Europe be your guide to the new normal. Join us weekdays on CGTN. emissions on the road but what happens when an electric vehicle runs out of charge the move from combustion engines to electric is accelerating rising fuel prices and growing awareness of the climate emergency are driving the change if the future is electric are city roadways ready is battery technology really greener and how can car makers put the brakes on costs? Plug in to our EV special series only on CGTN. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Euro. Quick reminder CGTN is available to watch for free on all of the major digital platforms on Smart TV or online at Rocco, Apple TV, Amazon Fire, and Android TV. YouTube, Daily Motion, CGTN.com, and the CGTN app, and in the UK on Freeview. Police in Norway say a bow and arrow attack which left five people dead appears to have been an act of terror. A 37-year-old Danish man has been arrested. The suspect had converted to Islam, and authorities say they'd been concerned about signs of radicalization. Two others, including an off-duty officer, were injured in the attack on Wednesday. At least 46 people have been killed in a fire at a tower block in Taiwan. The blaze broke out in the early hours of Thursday in a 13-story building in Kaohsiung City. The flames engulfed several floors of the building before firefighters could bring it under control. Officials say most of those who died were in residential apartments on floors 7 to 11. In Lebanon, at least six people have been shot dead as the inquiry into last year's Beirut port explosion begins. 
Protests over the handling of the inquiry turned violent as Hezbollah fighters clashed with troops. There were chaotic scenes at Beirut's Palais de Justice as bystanders scrambled to safety amid heavy sniper fire. Well, let's go live now to Beirut and talk to our correspondent, Mia Alberti. So, Mia, what's the situation now? Well, everything seems to be a little bit calmer. We are actually seeing the first cleanup efforts starting to begin in the site of the clashes in the center of Beirut. And we are also hearing the first reactions, the first positions from the Lebanese government. We heard the prime minister um, apologizing to the Lebanese people for the violence today. And most importantly, the president, Michel Aoun, saying that this violence was completely unaccept unacceptable, that people should be held accountable, although we still don't know who actually started the fighting and who was actually behind it. And uh, the president also said that he would do anything in his power to prevent the past from uh, repeating itself again. And that is a reference to the civil war during uh, the day. Today, we saw many people on social media comparing images of the civil war, which, which actually took place in this same neighborhood in Tawuni, was uh, one of the main uh, stages of the civil war in the center of Beirut. And so the president there uh, uh, referencing this comparison to the civil war. So a lot of open wounds for the Lebanese. I actually talked to a woman, a mother, who uh, said that she was traumatized during the civil war that she lived, lived through uh, as a child and that her children were actually traumatized by the blast last year and that now, as when I was talking to her, as she was just packing to flee Beirut, as many, like many other uh, residents have uh, done during the day. What I'm doing now is actually packing very quickly to go outside the route and up in the village somewhere, um, up in the mountains, because we fear escalation at night, so we're packing very quickly to, to exit the route. So Mia reports that this violence was down to various groups, groups clashing, all unhappy over the investigation into the port blast. Just remind us of the background. Yeah, sure. This has been something that has been brewing for quite some uh, while, not even days, months since the, the explosion happened and people started asking questions about what happened. Then we saw all of the political parties going against each other, but all of them criticizing the judge, criticizing the investigation. That's actually something they have in common. But today's um, events actually started with an escalation of tensions on Monday when the leader of Hezbollah, uh, Nassan Hasnala, uh, said that uh, criticized the judge, saying that he was putting some political bias into the investigation. Then on Tuesday, the judge continued his investigation, calling for questioning uh, a couple of ministers. One of them failed, uh, actually, the, both of them failed to appear, and so the judge uh, issued an arrest warrant against him. One important thing is that one of these ministers is the former finance minister, Ali Hussein Khalil, and he is from the Amal movement, which is an ally uh, to, the, to Hezbollah. So when uh, an, uh, um, an, a warrant for his arrest was um, issued, then that's when we saw Hezbollah asking for today's protests. And then just minutes before today's protests took place, we uh, saw that this appeal against the judge was rejected again. So that could have also spilled into the tensions today. Mia Alberti in Beirut, thanks very much. Hundreds of people have been moved to safety on Greece's second largest island, Evia, after unseasonably heavy rainfall caused flooding and mudslides. This comes just a few months after devastating wildfires burned one-third of the island's forests. Our correspondent Evangelo Sipsas reports. Just two months ago, residents of the Greek island of Evia were battling intense wildfires. Now another disaster has struck, floods. People in the towns of Agiana, Kotsikia and Achlavi woke up to find flooded basements and roads have been destroyed. Local resident Maria began cleaning up her house and restaurant after tons of mud water swept through her properties. Overnight we heard a loud sound that was getting closer and closer as the river was filling up with water. 
I was here alone with my husband, and we rushed fast to the first floor away from the stream. We literally got up seconds before the water came out in our restaurant. We couldn't do anything but sit and look until the sunrise. This has never happened before with so much water. Maybe it's because of the fires. And just as we were bouncing back from the destruction of the fires, now we have the floods. Extreme rainfall broke records last weekend in parts of Greece, bringing intense downpours. A storm called Athena has been buffeting northern and central Greece, with the weather station recording close to 700 millimeters of rain since last weekend. In Evia, there are no casualties from the heavy rains that hit the northern part of the island, but dozens of residents had to flee their homes as rocks, debris and mud reached one meter high. Rows became impossible and beaches were filled with mud sliding down from nearby mountains devoid of vegetation since the fire. Over 500,000 hectares of forest have been burned and as a consequence we experienced floods which destroyed an important part of the infrastructure. It has only been about two months since the fires we are working day and night to create flood defenses, but unfortunately, the area is too big. We have time against us. The government needs to change its bureaucracy so we can speed up the defenses. From burned trees and houses a few months ago to water and mud now, this is what the scene is like here in northern Evia. Whatever was left from the fires taken away by water in just a matter of hours. The Greek government announced over the weekend an emergency funding of $23 million to boost northern Evia's defenses against flooding. But the opposition party says more needs to be done. Mr. Takas and his government need to act now. They need to take decisions and measures to at least preserve whatever is left in the area. If he doesn't, there will be consequences. He already has responsibility of what has happened so far. The water has been receding as the weather has improved. A number of bulldozers have been already begun cleaning up and opening roads while locals take stock of the damage. But the Greek Meteorological Center is predicting more rain this week, possibly double the amount that has already fallen. So without vegetation to hold the waters and mud from gushing down the landscape, Maria's properties will have a hard time holding their ground. Evangelo Sipsas for CGTN, Northern Evia. Austria's new chancellor, Alexander Schallenberg, says the country remains a reliable and committed partner of the EU. Schallenberg traveled to Brussels in his first official trip since assuming the role and met with European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. The former foreign minister replaces Sebastian Kurz, who resigned last week amid corruption claims. Around 300 more people have been forced to flee their homes on La Palma as lava from the island's volcano is threatening to engulf a new area to the northwest. So far, lava from the eruption has destroyed about 1,500 homes and burnt nearly 600 hectares of land. The Spanish island has also been rocked by a number of earthquakes on an almost daily basis. An Italian court has started a trial of four senior members of Egypt's security services. They're accused of kidnapping and murdering an Italian student in Cairo in 2016. Giulio Regani, whose family were in court, disappeared during a trip to Egypt. His body was found a week later and a post-mortem revealed he'd been tortured. The officers deny involvement. The French President Emmanuel Macron has visited locations that will host the Paris 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. He also met young athletes in the suburb of saint saint denis one of uh, France's poorest neighborhoods. With the 2020 Tokyo Olympics delayed by a year due to the pandemic, there is a shorter break than usual before the next Games in Paris. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Joe Biden says offshore wind turbines are the future for America's energy, but expect a storm of protest. It's the first day in Germany that vaccination centers like this one are offering a third jab. There are fears there could be a fifth wave of COVID-19 cases. Market watchers have a keen eye on infection rates. Safety and efficacy of COVID-19 shots. France closed schools in the first lockdown in spring last year. France has been a leader is in vaccinating youngsters. If a spike necessitates another lockdown, 
Italy is now close to reaching its target of immunizing 80% of the population over the age of 12. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. We look at debt. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. We can try out a wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we try to save the world. Oh, no. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. The agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Brexit back to the drawing board. EU and UK officials try to unpick the trade deal on Northern Ireland. A global supply chain crisis. Now G7 ministers try to resolve the shipping and truck driver shortage. And 46 people have been killed in a deadly apartment block fire in Taiwan with dozens of people seriously injured. China plans to set up an international center for innovation on sustainable transport. President Xi Jinping made the announcement in a speech to a United Nations global conference. He said transportation is the backbone of the economy and called for a greener system as well as development of low-carbon technologies. We should leverage the enabling role of transport and increase related import in poor regions so that local economies and the people's lives could improve as a result of better roads. We should enhance north-south and south-south cooperation and scale up support for developing transport infrastructure in the least developed countries and landlocked developing countries in an effort to achieve common prosperity. Well, as world leaders try to find a sustainable solution to global transport, China's ramping up efforts to help the sector go green, as Xi Jana reports, electric vehicles could be the future of transport in the world's second largest economy. The UN says the transport sector produces a quarter of direct greenhouse gas emissions. Electric vehicles could help reduce that, depending on how the electricity is generated. The market for electric vehicles is growing. Almost as many were sold around the world in the first half of this year as the total for 2020. The highest sales were in China, where there was a 200% year-on-year increase. From January to August, sales of electric vehicles worldwide showed a high growth rate, with the global total reaching more than 3 million units, an increase of 150% year-on-year. The total number of electric vehicles sold in China has also seen an explosive growth, reaching 1.65 million units, accounting for half of the global share. The rapid expansion of the electric vehicle market in China is mainly due to active encouragement from the government. From January to September, 34% of sales were small mini cars and 30% were medium-sized cars. 
We have made a big breakthrough in the main market of medium and large EVs with high technology. And while a second family car, or in small and medium-sized cities and counties, small cars are performing extremely well. So we have a comprehensive development of both the high and low end of the market in China, which is driving the strong performance of the whole Chinese EV market. Sui says with China's commitment to reach peak emissions by 2030, the traditional car market will gradually shrink. There are still challenges like cheap shortages for high-end cars. But with demand growing and the tilt of policy, opportunities are much bigger than challenges. Xu Jia reporting from Beijing. The Biden administration has announced plans to develop offshore wind capacity, which could see wind turbines built off the United States coast. Seven areas will be auctioned off for wind farm licenses over the next few years. It's all part of President Biden's push to decrease America's reliance on fossil fuels and expand its green energy economy. Let's talk to our correspondent, John Terrett, in New York. Uh, John, tell us more about these uh, yes. plans from Joe Biden. Hey, Jamie. Hey there, Robin. I think you have to understand the first thing you must remember is that North America is not Europe, OK? North America is very, very late to the wind farm party. There really aren't very many of them around. I'll explain more about that in just a second. So what is planned today, according to the Department of Energy, is that seven areas around the coast have been earmarked for use as commercial wind farms, okay? And they will be tendered for auction to companies who wish to apply in the year 2025. And they will be in shallow waters off various areas of coastline or partly on the beach, that sort of thing. So they're going to be on the east coast, in the Gulf, and also up the west coast as well. Now. Our viewers are very welcome to tweet me and tell me I'm wrong about this, but as far as I know, there is only one commercial offshore wind farm in shallow waters in the whole of the country at the moment, and I've been there myself. It's Block Island, which is a little island situated in between Rhode Island and Long Island, about northeast of New York City, and it's 3.8 miles off the coast there. They have five turbines. They produce 30 megawatts. It's run by a company called Deepwater Wind. Now. Don't confuse that, if you Google this issue, with lots and lots and lots of proposals for wind farms all over the country. There's about 160 of those, as far as I can work out, but none of them are actually functioning nor connected at the moment. Earlier this year, the White House, under the Biden administration, approved uh, what I think is the second one, or will be, called the Vineyard Wind Farm, which is off Massachusetts. It'll provide electricity for 400,000 homes, but it's not up and running yet. Now, what is Biden proposing? He wants to produce 10... Oh, well, I mean, I don't know what this means, frankly. I don't think you do either. 30 gigawatts, whatever that is, enough to provide electricity for 10 million homes by the year 2030. Now, compare that to the UK, which is trying for 40 gigawatts over the same period, and our own China trying for 75 gigawatts over the same period. As an incentive, Biden is offering $150 billion to grease the wheels for companies and people who might be interested in moving towards wind power much more, and he hopes it will create 70,000 jobs as well. And just one final point on that. Universities, I've been to the University of Maine. This is a big issue for them. Engineering students spend a lot of time working on how to produce these wind turbines and make them better. It's a good thing for students to do, but it's very much an issue and an industry of the future for us here at the moment. Jamie and Robin? So, John, it, it's on then. It's happening, right? Or is it all just um, hot air? Well, I, my feeling here, my sense of it, is that it's going to end up being a bit half-hearted. I mean, I've told you before, this is very much a fossil fuel economy. Americans are addicted to fossil fuels. And when you talk to them at parties and things at the weekend, when I go to parties, I talk to people, they, the first thing they will say if this issue comes in, ah, yes, but the wind did not blow in the Midwest this year. Ah, yes, the wind did not blow in Europe this year. So the amount of production of electricity was massively down in those areas. They'll tell you that. Plus, there's going to be multiple legal challenges to all of this, from coastal communities, fishing folk. They'll be complaining about the sound of the turbines, the eyesore, because they are actually very ugly, as you know, danger to the leisure industry, wildlife, all that sort of stuff. Even American environmentalists are concerned about the danger to birds and wildlife. And the Department of Energy, along with this bigger 
announcement today is also saying it's putting $2 million to more research. And if it turns out it will hurt the wildlife, then these seven areas will be taken off the list. So I predict a lot of court gridlock over this one. And don't forget, there's two elections looming. The congressional one is just over a year away now. And campaigning for the next presidential election will begin in just over a year as well. So we'll see. We'll see, guys. John Terrett in New York. Thank you very much. Greece and Egypt have signed a preliminary deal to build an undersea cable connecting their electricity grids. It will be the first of its kind between Europe and Africa in the southeastern Mediterranean. Our correspondent Adal El Marouki reports from Cairo. This project is part of a bigger picture, a bigger project that is called the Euro-Africa Interconnector, a, a, a $4 billion project that aims to connect electricity grid from Africa um, to Europe. Egypt aims to be the focal point uh, of that uh, project. Now, the cable that will be extended all the way um, to um, uh, Greece will go through Cyprus. It's about uh, 1,600 kilometers long, uh, 500 kilometers of which will be going from Egypt to Cyprus and then from Cyprus um, to Greece and then to Europe. Um, the capacity, uh, the elect electric power capacity of the cable, which will be under um, the seabed and moving uh, for a depth of under um, 300 meters under sea level, um, the, the power capacity is about 2,000 uh, megawatts uh, of electric power, most of which will be produced, if not all, uh, by clean energy. Egypt has been investing tremendously in solar farms and solar farms and wind farms will be the main um, contributor to this electric power which will decrease the cost of uh, the generated electricity coming into Europe and at the same time utilize the excessive uh, electric power that Egypt has. Egypt has been investing tremendously in creating electric power uh, domestically. First was, the first aim was to cover um, domestic needs, which has been in a shortage until um, just a few years ago. But now Egypt is producing about 60,000 megawatts of electric power, and it has uh, excess of about 30 percent. That's nearly 20,000 megawatts of excessive electric power. And what the country wants to do with it, basically and simply, is to sell it. And that's why it has been moving since actually 1998. The country has been moving to connect electric electricity grids with nearby countries. There is a 3,000 megawatts electric uh, connector between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. There is about 500 megawatts connector with Jordan, uh, about 250 with Libya and 300 with um, Sudan. All of these, Jordan, Libya and Sudan, which are within the few hundreds, um, will are, are in the process to be expanded um, to um, increase the power capability for Egypt to export to Sudan, Libya, and, there, and from there to um, adjacent African countries as well. And Egypt wants to utilize the uh, natural gas resources, the massive um, discoveries that have been recently discovered in the East Mediterranean, along with its expansion in clean energy, um, to become a central hub in the Middle East and the East Mediterranean to connect Africa with Asia and Europe. It was a fatal disease which many hoped had been consigned to the history books, but tuberculosis is back. Deaths from TB have increased for the first time in more than a decade. It's been linked to disruptions in healthcare access due to the COVID pandemic. Dr. Teresa Casaiva is the director of the World Health Organization's Global TB Programme. For the first time in over a decade, WHO is reporting an increase in tuberculosis death. Tuberculosis is the world's second top infectious killer after COVID-19, claiming close to 4,100 lives a day. Approximately 1.5 million people died from TB in 2020, including more than 215,000 among HIV-positive people, almost double the number who died of uh, HIV-AIDS, and in the same time is the leading killer of people with HIV and the major contributor of antimicrobial resistance related death. Tuberculosis mostly affects adults in their most productive years. However, all age groups are at risk. Uh, over 90% of, of the cases and death are in developing countries and so-called high TB burden countries. It's well known that tuberculosis is a disease of poverty. What prevents its successful eradication? Unfortunately, TB response remains uh, 
critically underfunded uh, with uh, committed funding for TB prevention, care and uh, research falling far short. Global spending on TB diagnosis, treatment and prevention services uh, fell from 5.8 billion to 5.3 billion, which is less than a half of the minimum of the global target of 13 billion annually by 2022, which is needed. You paint a very gloomy picture. Uh, which new research shows the most promise to reverse this? There are about 14 TB vaccine candidates in clinical trials and some important development in this field. And we hope uh, that if we will have vaccine on the market as soon as possible, of course, it can dramatically change all, all, all the response to tuberculosis. For diagnostics, likewise, we are reviewing new methods for both infectious and uh, infection and disease, as well as for computer aided detection for imaging. The most promising research work uh, published this year uh, is probably related to new shorter regimens to treat drug susceptible TB. Now, the results of study 31 and SHINE trial describe the efficacy of uh, two four months regimens to treat TB in adults and children, respectively. And you know, uh, one of the main problem is the duration of TB treatment. is still long and minimum six months. So now we have better, uh, shorter, more effective treatment options, and they should be uptaken as soon as possible. You're watching CGTN still ahead. The various efforts to save the bees. We'll hear how their campaign is buzzing. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Murray, what would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe. China's counting down to the launch of its second crewed mission to its new space station. Three astronauts will blast off in just 24 hours. For the first time, the team will include a woman who will become China's first female astronaut to carry out a spacewalk. CCTN's Ning Hong reports. Three taikonauts will board the Shenzhou 13, Zhang Zhigang, Wang Yaping and Ye Guangfu. Their mission is to stay on the Chinese space station for 180 days. 56-year-old Jai Zhigang is an experienced taikonaut. In 2008, he became China's first to walk in space. He will command the Shenzhou 13 mission. In the past 13 years, the most difficult thing was not training, working, or studying. The most challenging thing is to do every simple task with the highest standard and passion, again and again and again. And I have confidence our crew will fulfill our mission. 
There's also a woman on the mission, 41-year-old Wang Yaping. She carried out the first space lecture back in 2013. The Shenzhou 13 journey is her second extraterrestrial mission, during which she will continue teaching students from orbit. After eight years, I'm happy to go to space again. I want my students to tell me what they want to see, what they're curious about. I'll show them around so they can explore and fulfill their wishes. The team also includes Ye Guangfu, who will conduct his first space flight. He was selected into the second group of technos and spent the last 11 years training. Exploring space and building a home in space for the human race is every Taikonaut's mission. I'm expecting that one day our colleagues from abroad can join us. We welcome them on China's space station. The three Taikonauts will board the Shenzhou 13 spacecraft already on the launch pad. Their mission will focus on further testing and verifying equipment and conditions on the Chinese space station, which will consist of Tianhe core module, two Tianzhou cargo ships, and the Shenzhou 13 spacecraft. The three Taikonauts will spend the next 180 days in space. They will break the record of Chinese Taikonauts' stay in space. And from this moment on, every step they take will break records of China's manned space mission. Ning Hong, CGTN. Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. China is hosting the Ecological Civilization Forum following this week's COP15 Biodiversity Conference. It's brought together more than 2,000 representatives from over 800 organizations. China's efforts towards improving the environment were recognized at the opening ceremony, with 100 new areas given special national ecological status. China's President Xi Jinping has announced a new national parks project to bring more land under stronger state protection. France's ambassador to China said he was proud to be collaborating on the project. Well, it's of course uh, very important and uh, I'm also proud that uh, we are cooperating uh, together for that. And next month I will go to Zhejiang province where we have uh, a cooperation between l'Agence Française de Développement and uh, local authorities. It's not only about financing projects, it's also about uh, exchange of expertise, it's about uh, twinning between national parks in France, in Europe and in China. And at each time that I go to um, some provinces and I discuss with local authorities, I can uh, really realize that it's not uh, only a speech from the top, but also that uh, people in the provinces, they, they are aware of uh, the need and they are really committed. We've been looking at efforts to preserve important genetic information around the world. China's National Gene Bank opened in 2016 in the city of Shenzhen. Because China is one of the most biologically diverse countries in the world, the center has always been at the cutting edge of research. Huang Fei reports. A terrace paddy field may be an unlikely view near a major trading port, but it's an architectural tribute to Chinese scientists who cracked the genomic code of rice, the staple food for two-thirds of the world's population. The China National Gene Bank is built on that legacy and equipped with cutting-edge technologies. It aims to help collect, store, and decipher genetic data of all life on Earth. So in the future, the mining of this genetic material or to uh, decoding the genetic construction is even more important. Uh, there are at least 300,000 edible plants in the world. However, 65% of our food are coming from only about nine major crop species. So there's a, a great deal of room for developing or domestication of new plants. A first step to creating new food is understanding the seeds. Up to 100,000 samples can be stored here under different temperature settings. So I'm inside a seed bank, and this is minus 20 degrees Celsius. So you can see I've wrapped up really warm. The low temperatures are meant to stop the chemical and biological activity that could break down cells so that the samples can live much longer. Some of the seeds can survive here for over a century. The knowledge gained from studying these boxes takes some of the guesswork out of plant breeding. It helps to ensure future food supply amid growing populations and shrinking arable land. We are facing a serious problem of plant and genetic resources loss, and uh, such a survival can efficiently protect the genetic diversity in rare and imperiled plant species. Sequencing the 
plant genomes could advance our understandings of the plants regarding their evolving strategies to be productive and combat the plant stress. The same idea applies in human genome sequencing, which thanks to these machines can be done much faster and more cheaply. The results will guide precision medicine and are already applied in prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome. So we continue to work with uh, the various research institutes uh, in uh, large population reducing uh, birth defects, diseases such as uh, cancer and uh, cardiac diseases, as well as uh, you know, transmissible diseases such as uh, the COVID. The National Gene Bank has also proposed a genome database of Chinese wild animals, expanding a collection of dried samples into a more durable digital repository. Scientists could use it to restore a damaged ecosystem and limit the impact of climate change. With a wealth of life and health data providing a safeguard for Earth's future, it's not surprising the National Gene Bank has dubbed China's Noah's Ark. Huang Fei, CGTN, Shenzhen. In 2019, just before the start of the pandemic, the German state of Bavaria launched a campaign to protect the natural habitat of bees. It followed warnings from scientists that up to a third of the world's bee population was at risk of extinction. CGTN's Natalie Carney reports. It's hard to imagine that these little guys can be so important for the world's biodiversity. But the fact of the matter is, without bees, our planet would be a very different place. Bees are responsible for the pollination of one-third of our crops, such as fruit trees, berries, and vegetables. But a 2019 scientific study of insects worldwide found that more than 40% of insect species were in decline. That includes bees. The loss of meadows, climate change, and pesticides all play a powerful role in that demise. We have another flächennutzung. Our land use is very agriculturally intensive, and we have to act ecologically. We need open land for the development of wild bee habitats. The pollination of our plants is very dependent on the bees, therefore the diversity of bees, and by that I mean both wild bees and honey bees, means we must have a diversity of plants and a great diversity in our cultural landscape. Martin Lell looks after the honey bees at Munich's Ecological Education Center. He also helped promote Bavaria's Save the Bees campaign. The bees were actually just the figurehead. Our petition had two different names. It was not only called Save the Bees, but it was also called Popular Initiative for Biodiversity. The aim was to improve Bavarian conservation laws to include more protection for nature and wildlife. The petition called for 20% of agricultural land in Bavaria to meet organic standards by 2025 and 30% by 2030, for 10% of green space to be turned into wildflower meadows, and for land and streams to be more rigorously protected from pesticides and fertilizers. The petition was the most successful in Bavarian history, garnering 1.75 million signatures and prompting the state premier, Marcus Zoda, to write it straight into law rather than taking the petition to a referendum. With the approval of 85% of Bavaria's state MPs, Zoda said he would take the text of the petition word for word and promised to provide farming industry with support to carry out the required transformations. Bavaria has the most farmed land of any German state. Now, similar initiatives are being developed across the country, and it's also hoped the Save the Bee campaign will spark a buzz in other European countries. Natalie Carney, CGTN, Munich. The headlines again. Brexit, back to the drawing board. EU and UK officials try to unpick the trade deal on Northern Ireland. A global supply chain crisis. G7 ministers try to resolve the shipping and truck driver shortage. And 46 people have been killed in a deadly apartment block fire in Taiwan with dozens of people seriously injured. That's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube and Dailymotion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app. And in the UK on Freeview. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Goodbye.